that the world, the world, the COVID experience for the last six months has changed the world. What it's done is it's put the changes that probably would have occurred over the next five to 10 years, it's put those on steroids. And it's, it's meant that businesses that would have made changes are going to rapidly introduce those changes. And the, and the work from home experience that we've had globally has massively impacted um, societies, cultures, corporations. And as I've said already, we're going to move into a world, not necessarily immediately, but we are rapidly moving to a world where you have talent without boundaries. Welcome to another episode of the People Harm interview series. I'm your host Divya Rao and let's begin with a quick introduction of People Harm. People Harm is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Harm blog and the video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Ian Molson is a recruitment, NLP and employment futurist, influencer and a sage global business expert with proven track record of aiding businesses and individuals to achieve and very often exceed their growth ambitions. He's a global influencer and a business and personal growth coach to the talent recruitment sector. Welcome Ian, we are extremely thrilled to have you. Oh, thank you. It's lovely to be here, Divya. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much. All right. So, Ian, you've obviously had quite an exciting journey this far. So, can you share with our audience about how you came to be the business growth expert at Talent Futures? Um, yeah, um, I've been in the recruitment industry sector for about, this is my 35th year. Okay. So, um, so a lot has changed in 35 years, um, and I don't intend to bore your audience with all the changes and everything, but um, I've, I've worked as a consultant doing permanent and contract recruitment in the technology sector, engineering sectors. Uh, in my youth, uh, I've then done managed offices, opened offices, um, worked for the leading sector specialist in the UK in computer people who are now part of the ADECO group worked for a business that got acquired by Hayes in 2000, then worked for Hayes setting up businesses across the whole of the European mainland continent, came back to the UK, ran Hayes Telecoms for a while, Hayes Technology for a while, and then became the public sector director for Hayes IT. And I grew that business from 2% of turnover to over 50% of turnover with a team of salespeople. And then we, and then in about 2008, I think I became the public sector director for RPO and MSP across the whole of the UK. Um, for all brands, not just that IT and technology, all brands. So that was accounting, finance, office support, education. And then uh, I left Hayes about coming up for 10 years ago. And I've been, since then, I've been using my skills and knowledge in growing and establishing businesses in recruitment to help customers across the whole of the sector. Right. So okay. I've worked with, oh, I've lost track, 40, 50 upwards companies across the UK, Europe, America, Asia, Asia Pac, and helping those businesses grow. Um, and I'm now, I, 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 I'm basically typified as a, as a growth coach, um, but I'm also a non-exec director as well of a number of recruitment agencies. And as you've pointed out in your intro, I'm, I've, my social media presence in the last two or three years has been recognized as a, as a global influencer. I, I think Onalytica last track ranked me in the top 10 in the world on the future of work and the future of talent and recruitment. Wow. So there you go. That's just a very quick potted history. No, but that's really amazing and quite interesting to learn so much about your, where you started and where you are today. I also believe that what you're doing today, I think businesses always need sort of uh, new eyes and a fresher perspective. Somebody who brings in a fresher perspective to look at situations or to look at problems to sort of re-energize the business, right? Yeah, yeah. Um... 
especially at this point in time, uh, Devere, because I think right now um, the world is going through a phenomenal period of change. I um, I, I've been I've been writing blogs now, speaking at conferences um, for two or three years about how the future of the recruitment, uh, well, the future of, of work is going to change and therefore the re future of talent acquisition and talent recruitment and talent development is changing. Um, and I've been making predictions and forecasts along with other people in the sector. Um, and I noticed some of your other speakers, you know, are in the same space as myself. And, and there's a lot of commonality about what the changes are. But in the last six, nine months, um, the whole COVID pandemic has massively, hugely changed the future landscape of the world, both in, well, in every single continent of the world. Uh, and I think that is really the most exciting. Well, there's a number of ways to look at this. We can either be terrified and scared of the changes or we can embrace it. Yeah. And, and I'm choosing to embrace it because, because the consequences of not embracing it and using it for the benefit of mankind are quite frightening if we don't do that. So yeah, that's my view. We have to do that. Yeah, I quite agree with that myself as well. Um, so Ian, you're also a personal growth coach, right? And I have heard yeah. that coaching is also itself a personal growth journey. So how has that changed you as a person? And what according to you are the few things that people should be mindful of before they enter into a coaching engagement? Wow, that's a really uh, thought-provoking question. Um, how much time have we got? <laughs> um, so to answer your question, um, I'm a coach now because I've been on a personal journey, okay? Um, and I don't mind discussing this. Um, uh, I, I suffered some mental health issues to do with my youth, my childhood. Um, which is probably part of the reason I went into recruitment and sales in the first place, because it, in my youth, it fed a part of my personality. Um, and which is why I, I ended up in that destination. But in my forties, I recognized I needed to do something about my mental health challenges. And I went and spent a period of four or five years doing some therapy. And at the end of that, it did change me. And as a result of that, I wanted to go in a new career. So I felt helping and coaching and developing people and working with people was what I wanted to spend the rest of my working career doing. So that's what I spent the last 10 years doing. So that's how I was changed before I became a coach. Right. And I think when you become a coach, if you're going to be true and authentic to what you're teaching other people, you have to follow some of the disciplines that you are coaching people. So yes, yeah, it, it, it causes you, it, it holds a mirror up to you like this and you have to look at yourself and say, okay, I'm telling these people over here to behave like this. You know, am I, am I really behaving that way as well? So yeah, it's quite deep and, it, and some of the changes are, it's like peeling an onion, you know, you just take some layers off and then we're all constantly working with ourselves. And, and you, you will be, as a young person, you will be developing yourself and you will be working on improving your skills and capability, whether it's your, you know, your interviewer. So maybe you'll be improving your interview techniques. I can see a, as, your, as your readers and listeners will be able to see, there's a wealth of knowledge in the bookcases behind you. So maybe you'll be expanding your knowledge and wisdom by reading those and then you'll be challenging your own thoughts and values so yeah it's it's an interesting journey definitely we could talk for hours about it but yeah. hopefully that answers your question yeah but uh, also what do you think the people who are entering into a coaching engagement what are the few things that they should have in mind before they start their own personal journey with coaching um good question I think you need to I think you need to ask yourself why you're going into coaching. Right. Okay. Um and what is you know what is your what is your reason for for coaching people? If 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 you're seeking financial reward then that's not the answer. Um right. if you are doing it because you want to develop other people and you get 
you get rewards for doing that. Then it, it, is, it is a very rewarding um, occupation. I mean, the way, I, I recently relaunched our new brand, uh, Talent Futures, and I was working with a marketing expert and he asked me what it is I do. And I explained that ultimately we, we, we change and affect people's lives. We help them to transform. Okay. And, and that's basically what I do. I work with businesses and with, with individuals within those businesses to help them transform. Hopefully, you know, we can guide them to a better place where they are better people as a result of the, of the work they do on themselves with our guidance and support. But one of the challenges you have um, as a coach, it's like being a parent. You have to allow your, your coaches or your mentees um, the freedom to make mistakes and the freedom to go on their own personal journey. Um, and your job as a coach is there to support them and help them. But ultimately, if they want to make a, a decision which isn't necessarily a wise one at the time, as long as they benefit from that and you can support them as they take the next journey, um, yeah, that's what you have to do. But what you have to do is, is sometimes you have to curb your natural instinct to control them. You might want to stop somebody making what you think is a big mistake, but you can't do that. Your job as a coach is to guide them and support them. But if they want to make a big mistake, it's a free world. They have to be allowed to do that. Right. So you allow them to make mistakes as well. Do I allow them? <laughs> yes, you have to allow them. Wow. If you're looking for a black and white answer, the answer is yes, you have to allow them to make mistakes. It's free world. That's what a coach genuinely does, has to do. That's a good point. Because sometimes they will learn from that mistake. Right. And, support. Uh, and some, sometimes these aren't big mistakes, you know. Sometimes these are, you know, small course. ones. So, right. yeah. Right. So, listening to your journey, I'm sure it must have been quite a hustle when you started out, but pretty rewarding now and in the end. Uh, so what you're saying basically is an open mindset is very important when you enter into a coaching engagement, right? Yeah, you need to have an open mindset. You need to have, so you also have to look at yourself constantly. Um, you also have to manage your own um, mindset. You have to manage your own um, energy levels. Mm. Um, you also have to have greater... I mean, we were talking in the modern world about being emotionally intelligent. Yeah. So as a, as a coach yourself, you have to become emotionally intelligent as you will help your mentees and your coaches how to become more emotionally intelligent themselves. So one of the things, if you believe in the Dan Goldman model, is you will... Um, uh, you will you will help them improve their self awareness. That's one of the key steps in in helping people on in, uh, improving their emotional intelligence. Mm. Right. So um, people should ask themselves if they trust themselves enough to do the job and do the work as well. Yeah, I mean, I my journey to do what I do now is having done my my own. Therapy. I then did a, a NLP. Right. So I did a diploma, a practitioner, and a master practitioner course. Right. And if you do it properly, rather than just get the badge by just, you know, attending the courses, you have to, if you go on a proper journey. So I did about 30 to 40 days worth of, of, of learning and actually going through programs and going away in this on top of that, there is self-reflection and work you do outside the classroom. Mm. And if you do all of that, it's, it's unusual for somebody to come through that process and it not affect them as a person. Mm. So it does change you as a person. So that's part of my training. But it's not the only journey. You can go and do a, a certificate in coaching or you can do a diploma or, or, or other studies. But you have to... I think it's important that you... Yeah, I'm going to use the word you have to. You don't have to. I think it's, it's, it's prudent of you to actually look at, at some self-reflection and self-improvement. Yeah. And these are tough times and unprecedented times, right? Especially now 
with changing times and increasing automation i think people have kind of gotten stressed out since uh, a lot of them are worried if the human element or if human skills are just like easily dispensable and uh, if ai or new age technology will replace them so uh, what according to you uh, are the changes which are in store for the workplaces and the nature of work itself okay right there okay there are there are there are two elements to your question uh, yeah. in fact there's, there's quite a few other elements but the first thing is from the from the research from the the various reports the articles the books that are written there are typically regarded as about five six or seven um, qualities that human beings have that can't at the moment um, and again there's some debate over this but certainly in the foreseeable future can't be replicated by artificial intelligence and machines okay and if your job contains a number of these things then that will ultimately make your job one that is difficult to automate so I'll, get, I'll go through some of these so one of them is is create is original thought so if you are designing or creating something from scratch that's not something at the moment computers and artificial intelligence can do so where where you've got a job where you've got a i don't know an engineer who's designing a new bridge or construction of a bridge not a standard bridge but something that is particularly unique those those skills are not something that can be replicated immediately by ai but ai can support them but the primary function has to be done by human. Yeah. Designing clothes, my daughter's a fashion designer in, in London. She works in designing or freelance designer. She designs clothes and jewelry and things like that. So that's original creative thought. Um, IT developers. Um, so you've got engineers, developers, artists. So that's a skill, that's, a, that's a number one. Another one is influencing skills. So, Salespeople do a lot of influencing. That's not where you're doing human to human. Um, so salespeople are involved in influencing. So are management, senior management, that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, politicians, to a degree, influence. I'm not going to get into debating whether they'd be better replaced by robots, because at the moment, I think there'd be a consensus they probably would. But that's a, that's a personal opinion on some of them. There are, there are other elements. Uh, abstract thinking critical thinking so where you've got concepts that come so where there's a black and white agreement that this is the way to solve a problem that's easy we can create a rule we can create artificial intelligence to do that but where you've got two conflicting um theories about how you solve a problem and it's a judgment call as to which is right and which is wrong until that judgment can be codified and created by a set of rules it's very difficult to do that so that's an area where it, you know so when you get into senior decision making in businesses where it's a judgment call mm -hmm. um so chief execs hospital administrators um you know in in terms of accounting decision making taking the data in analyzing it and making a decision on it that's not something that can be done by ai um other areas are caring so you know the emotional intelligence the the emotional connection um there is some evidence yeah. um that some people would like to be cared by robots but actually there's an awful lot of evidence that says that actually i want to be cared by a human being so the caring industries the health industries you know whether that be we've talked about coaching we've talked about mental health whether you're caring physically for the elderly or emotionally those are things so psychotherapists you know um that's not something you're going to replace by a computer tomorrow yeah um teaching teaching is a skill that actually requires a number of these together and again teachers is not a job that can be replaced by a computer straight away so um there's a great um there's a bit of work done by a couple of um oxford professors called osborne and frey and they've analyzed a whole raft of job uh, role descriptions, whatever you want to call them, um, for the US market. It, it, a lot of it's true for other um, economies in the world. And they've worked out what is the probability of that job being um, automated in the next 12, in the next 10 years. Um, 
And those which have a lot of the qualities I've just talked about are not necessarily ones that can be automated quickly. Um, ones where they're low in that, which are rule-based, they can be automated. Mm. Um, leadership is another one of those qualities that, um, and I, I've, I've written a couple of blogs on this. There's also a video. So, you know, if people go to my website, they can see that. And if you, if anyone particularly wants to see them, I can share that link to them. So the second part of your question was around, how do I see that changing the world of work, didn't you? Okay, and that's, that's the interesting thing. So those jobs which can be readily automated. So I'll give you an example of one, um, bookkeeping. So I, I run a business, 10, 12 years ago, I would buy products, I'd keep the receipt, I'd give them to my bookkeeper or my accountant, um, and they would take those receipts and they'd put them onto a ledger and they would add them to my accounts. They'd produce a profit and loss and that's the way it goes. That's what happened 10 years ago. If truth be told, my young uh, children who were in their teen years, I used to give them my receipts and say, sort those, match those to the credit card bills and the bank statements and, you know, and then we're, you know, we could leave that for the accountant. Nowadays, that's done differently. So I now use a piece of software, uh, Sage have one, uh, Zero have one, Quicken have one, which is a, um, which is a rule based system whereby you literally put in your um, bank feed, your credit card feed. It says, oh, there's a transaction here. Ian bought some stationery or he's bought a coffee from Starbucks. And the rule says, you know, Starbucks should be posted as travel and subsistence. Um, stationery goes through so this this work this stuff from office direct that goes through is stationery and it posts those things and now there is software you can buy that links into your accounting software that collects the receipt and and just marries it up and make sure all the tax is done now ten five ten years ago that was done by a person now I've got a computer system with AI that does that for me that's a job that's gone and there are lots of jobs like that in paralegal. The role of a paralegal will be hollowed out. There'll be a high percentage of that job because it's repetitive and it's research that AI can do. In a hospital, studying um, uh, scans of people's vital organs to check for disease and illness. You know, computers are far better at spotting the, the differences in cell structure, far better than a human is. And there's been research done with um, Oxford Brooks University in the Radcliffe Hospital in, in the UK, where they've identified that AI is more efficient and more accurate than consultants. Now, does that mean that consultants are going to lose their job? No, but that element of the job that was done by a consultant will be used. So you'll have, you'll have AI that will replace jobs. You'll have AI that what's called augments. That means adds to or supports a job supports decision making and then you've got jobs that just won't change and that that is happening faster now as a result of covid that's the key message the key message is most businesses across the world will sadly be making redundancies unless they're in a growth sector like retail or online retail and when they come to re-employ people maybe they won't re-employ them maybe they'll adopt ai but AI is also going to create jobs. There are going to be jobs that didn't exist. Okay. So, you know, you, I mean, if we go back 10 years ago, before social media was a real mainstream thing, if you'd, have, if you'd have been at university and you'd said to somebody, I'm going to be a vlogger, your university lecturer would have said, what's a vlogger? Whereas now we all know what vloggers are. You know, we, we watch... We watch whether it's, I don't know, cooking programs. We have something in the UK called Strictly Come Dancing. We had a contestant last year on Strictly Come Dancing who was a global influencer. Ten years ago, nobody had known what a global influencer was or a social media influencer. So there are new jobs being created. And that's, that's happened for centuries. There's a great picture of Fifth Avenue in New York in 1900 on Easter Sunday and the Easter parade is a parade of horse-drawn carriages down Fifth Avenue. Ten years later, oh and in 1900 there was one auto, uh, 
automotive vehicle. So one car, I'm not even sure it was a car or a lorry. 10 years later, there is one horse-drawn carriage and all the other vehicles are cars. So in 1900, if you were a farrier, somebody who puts shoes on horses, you know, that would have been your job and you'd have had a great job doing that. 10 years later, there wouldn't have been much work for you, would there? Or there wouldn't have been as many farriers in, in New York and there wouldn't have been many people making carts. But 10 years later, they had mechanics repairing cars in garages. That's something else, by the way, that at the moment, unless we standardise how we manufacture things and replace them, it's very difficult for robots to go into your loft and fix a leaky pipe. That needs a person. So that's a job. Maintenance and repair is still something that for the time being will be done by human beings. So that's the change on a sort of micro level that's happening. What are the, I mean, there are, there are some colossal changes on how that will happen to society. So we're going to see a shift in employment. And then of course, I haven't even mentioned the whole work from home thing. So you asked me about AI. So that's, that, I've answered your AI question. Yeah. But the other single biggest thing that's happened in the last six months is the whole world has had an experiment in work from home. You know, I don't know, I don't know where you are in Asia at the moment, but in the UK and in Europe, people like um, Facebook have, have said none of their staff will return to work in an office until next year. Cisco, who are one of the companies that I work with globally, their entire global workforce is working from home and has, and has done in the main for several years now. So how are we going to use the office if we're not going in five days a week? How we design an office and what it's going to look like will be very different. And there's one single biggest thing in my sector in recruitment that is going to change, and that is we are going to see a world where talent occurs without boundaries. Yeah. So whereabouts are you, whereabouts are you living in at India. the moment? India. Whereabouts in India? Mumbai? Yeah, in Mumbai. Okay. So 10 years ago, if you were to apply for a job, a new job, you'd have to look for a job in Mumbai unless you were prepared to relocate to, I don't know, Jakarta or Islamabad or Sydney in Australia or something like that. Okay? No. Right. Today, if, you, if you're working for a global, a, a truly global company, you could apply for a job anywhere in the world. Yeah, I agree. You know, in, we have a situation where in the UK, everything is, at the moment, is London-centric. Mm -hmm. So people travel in and out of London up to an hour and a half every day by train and car and whatever. Yeah. Because they go into the office five days a week. If we change the rules and you only have to go into the office two days a week, one day a week, you can live anywhere, can't you? Right. right. And if you never have to go into the office, you could work for a London company. Right. From here. So what we end up with is we end up in a world with talent without boundaries. Mm. And that is the single biggest change that people in my sector have got to wake up to very quickly is that business operating models are going to go continental and global very quickly. And at the moment, they are very focused on finding people in Mumbai or in London to work for Mumbai and London companies. That's the single biggest change. And in the technology sectors, it has already happened. No, so, okay, so just expanding on what you said about AI and the human elements. So what, let me just like uh, clear this out. So we are talking about adopting a sort of synergistic approach to create a symbiotic relationship and capitalize on that symbiotic relationship between AI and the human element yeah. and human yeah. experiences, right? So that's uh, the key rule, the golden rule to sustain in today's job market and the business. So, so, so um, some, of, some of the job changes will be symbiotic. Right. They will be working in harmony with AI. Some of them may not be. Some of them might be purely substitutional. Mm. Right. But what you will have is, in, in a, if you're in a business which employs, I don't know, let's say 100 people. Let's keep the math simple. 
And of those 100 people, some of their jobs may disappear altogether, okay? Okay, some of those jobs might lose 20% of their tasks that they, so let's think in terms of a task. A job role maybe have 20, 30 tasks that you do as part of your job in a week, okay? If, if let's say of those 20 jobs, five of them are now gonna be done by computers, that means your business can grow quite easily by allowing you to, you're, you're getting rid of five tasks, which allows you to do those remaining 15 tasks more times, so that increases the productivity. Or you can provide a better quality of service, can't you? Yeah. So what I'm hearing from some of my clients is they're using AI to give their employees more time to give better customer service. But that's one of the big changes. Another might be because that allows them to be more efficient. It also allows them to redeploy people into other jobs. Mm. You know, ultimately, we're creating all of this artificial intelligence and robotics. We need people to manage and create rules for these and to look at other ways of harvesting and using the technology to make productivity gains. Mm. So that ultimately becomes a job in itself, doesn't it? Right. I agree. So what you might see is, is people, so I, I can go back 20 years ago when we brought computers into manufacturing plants, we saw a lot of people who worked in what's called process engineering suddenly getting involved in computers and people move from being process engineers looking after the machines to becoming what are called business analysts and moving into the role of business analysis where they actually looked at the continuity of the machine and the computers and how the two came together. So people move from say the manufacturing industry into the IT industry. Same happened in insurance. You had insurance analysts, people looking at the paper processes, and if we're gonna replace those with computers, they would need a business analyst who knew about the paper processes. So they moved from the paper insurance process into the IT process. So again, another job was created and people were moved. So it doesn't mean that if your job is is displaced that you get unemployed it might mean that you have an opportunity to create to your role to change and i and good companies are doing that large corporate businesses are recognizing that's what they need to do because the knowledge of their sector and the knowledge of their industry is really important and taking those people with that knowledge and educating them how to do business process re-engineering or business analysis or system design those those skills are quite important mm. but we might actually see certain businesses who just say we're going to get rid of all those people right. so when amazon decide to deploy robots in their warehouses and they can do 90 percent of the moving of goods in a warehouse without human beings regrettably we might see people in warehouses lose their jobs the research from the world economic Thor forum and the in Europe, the European Union is suggesting that if you have a high level qualification, so if you have a degree, your chances of your job being displaced and you being made unemployment are quite low. But if you have a very low level of skills in terms of educational background, so in, in the UK that would be GCSEs or, a, or what we call a level one uh, qualification or level two qualification, then the chances of your job being replaced by a robot is quite high. Mm. Wow. So along with elimination of certain jobs or certain profiles, concurrently opportunities are always going to present themselves. Yeah, um, there's a great slide which I don't have access to right now, but again, I can share with your um, with your users, which is which is an infographic from um, Salesforce, and it's 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 basically the good old X Y coordinates. Mm. So in one quadrant. If we, if we move into a world in which um, new jobs are created um, faster than old jobs are being displaced, we'll have a skill shortage. And therefore, people in the new roles will carry very high premiums. The converse is also true. If we end up in a world where old jobs are being displaced or made redundant faster than new jobs are being created, we'll get redundancies, won't we? And we'll get large-scale unemployment. 
you could have a situation where um, where new jobs are created fast and old jobs are are, are made redundant are, are also created fast and you get this huge change taking place so you know you've got thousands of people losing their jobs over here but you get thousands of new jobs being created here and you get this huge change and the fourth scenario is actually we get very few new jobs and we get very new few old jobs and actually the old world looks like the new world my personal view is we'll probably over the next five to ten years go through all four of those areas at periods of time um, what COVID is on the face of it in some industries likely to do is see a lot of existing jobs being displaced, made redundant before the new jobs are created. Um, but my, my belief is that globally we need to upskill our global workforce. So we need to better educate, better train. I think it's two or three years ago, I could find the report for you, the European Council that looks after skills across the whole of Europe identified that across the whole of Europe there was something like nine million people unemployed. And at the same time, if you took all of the skills gaps, all of the jobs where there were we need skilled workers, there were nine million vacancies we couldn't fill. So over here we got nine million unemployed, and over here we got nine million jobs we can't fill. Sadly, these people weren't educated to do these jobs. And I think if you look at the world, we have the same problem. Right, I agree. So upskilling yourself and reskilling constantly in order to sustain is also very important. I mean, it's absolutely. You, I sense you're a little bit younger than me, only because I've got more grey hairs than you. But <laughs> your generation is going to struggle. You're going to have to learn that. You're absolutely correct, and that in itself is a new skill. Yeah. This, the ability to retrain yourself, probably the last, the last estimate I saw was two or three times in your career. You will probably have two or three careers in different jobs in your lifetime. Yeah. Wow. Now, that might frighten some people <laughs> equally. It could be really exciting, couldn't it? You know? Yeah. Let me give you a statistic which the World Economic Forum issued last year. And that is that 65%, two thirds of the young people in primary schools in the Western world, in, probably in India and, and, uh, and China and across the whole of the, of the educated world, two thirds of them are going to get into jobs that don't even exist today. Most, most, most primary school children are never going to learn to drive a car. Because by the time they get old enough to drive one, they'll be self-driving cars on the roads. Right. Now you think about that. Can you drive a car? No. I there you go. You see, you might never learn to drive a car. Mm. I bet your parents can drive cars. Yeah. There you go. I understand that technology is now permeated even the recruitment sector. How different yeah. the recruitment sector will be five years down the line. Wow. Now, if I tell you this and I'm right, somebody out there is going to make a lot of money, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you some ideas of, of the sorts of things that are happening and what, what people are talking about. So last year I did some work with IBM. Um, again, there's a, a video interview with a guy called Dr. Nigel Gamal. Okay. Nigel is an AI specialist for IBM. And what he is creating is the use of artificial intelligence in the human resource process. So one of the things very quickly I can tell you is already happening now is, is, is companies are using artificial intelligence to process candidate applications. Yeah. Okay. So not in the areas where we have huge skill shortages like IT or engineering, but in, in the places where we've got large volumes of candidates applying for a limited number of jobs. So in a call center, for example, or a customer service center, okay? And, and in those contact center locations, sometimes they can get 100, 200 applications for one role. So artificial intelligence is being used to identify the best candidates for the job, okay? And that's one thing that will happen straight away. 
Um, video interviewing, if I'd have said to you five years ago that most videos in the West, if you think about it, in the last 12 months, most of the interviews that have taken place um, have, have probably been virtual like we're doing right now. Yeah. Job interviews. I'm not talking about interviews like we're doing. I'm talking about job interviews. Now, that's what's happened in the last six months because there's been no way people would physically go to an, in, to an interview in Mumbai or, or whatever, or, Jalama, or Islamabad or something like that because they wouldn't, they wouldn't be physically welcome in, a, in an office face to face unless they're all wearing masks and things. Mm. So that is happening. That's become the New York norm. And because we're using this electronic medium to communicate an interview, there's now artificial intelligence that can be used to read my body languages and yours. And to, and to give a probability whether when you give me a question, the answer I'm giving you is truthful or not. Almost like a lie detector. And so where else is technology being used? In finding candidates. So I know a lot of the... Um, Global companies use offshore businesses in India, in uh, Asia, in um, South America, Eastern Europe to research candidates, to find candidates. So they get a job vacancy today and they will use an offshore company to overnight search for candidate skills either on LinkedIn or on technology platforms or, or, or on databases and provide agencies with that shortlist overnight. Okay. That's currently very labor intensive. In the next two to three years, that a lot of that will be done by artificial intelligence. Yeah, but that is sort of frightening uh, to think about all of these things. Um, is it frightening? Why, why do you feel it's frightening? What's frightening about it? What worries you about it? I mean, especially recruitment and what you spoke about, lie detectors and body language and everything. I mean, that's something a lot of people don't know about. I'm telling you that's possible yeah. if I think ethically businesses will be comfortable using it your reaction tells me that whilst it's technically possible I think culturally we're not ready for it yet yeah I guess so but I think you'll find some people feel will feel quite uncomfortable about about you know robots or artificial intelligence screening them for a job interview right. Right. You, you can all, I mean, you, you already have um, bots which will talk to you. So when you're applying for a job, if you've got questions about the job, mm. you know, you'll find there are bots already being used. Mm. I mean, you know, if you're opening a bank account now, you can use a, a bot to help you do it. If you're applying for a mortgage, you can get a bot to do that. Yeah. So those things. But yes, I think some of these things can be quite scary. And I, I'm not necessarily comfortable with them myself. Mm. Um, but then, as I say, I, you know, I've got grey hairs, I'm a bit old school, so I still think there's an awful va a lot of value in the personal chemistry that develops, particularly in small businesses, maybe in larger businesses, it's a, a lot easier to use. But it does take away um, um, bias, doesn't it? it? It does make it more, um, it, it, it works for a better diverse workforce, doesn't it, don't you think? I agree. There's no prejudice involved in the process, you know. But then we have to check that there is no inherent bias in the way the artificial intelligence programmer has written the program. And that's another job that we'll be creating because right. we'll have specialists who will go around vetting artificial intelligence systems to make sure there's no um, um, bias in, in the way they're structured or the way they're working. Right. So opportunities everywhere once again. So uh, I would just like to ask you if you have any last sound and sound bites that you would like to share with our audience? Um, yeah, I think I do actually. And I think the message that I'm, that I'm talking to a lot of people about right now, it is quite simple that, um, that the world, the world, the COVID experience for the last six months has changed the world. What it's done is it's put the changes that probably would have occurred over the next five to ten years is put those on steroids and it's it's meant that businesses that would have made changes are going to rapidly introduce those changes and the and the work from home experience that we've had globally has massively impacted um societies cultures corporations 
And as I've said already, we're going to move into a world, not necessarily immediately, but we are rapidly moving to a world where you have talent without boundaries. And that is going to accelerate some of the things we just talked about a second ago, which is the use of technology in recruitment. So if you can place a job on a job board in, I don't know, Paris, and you're getting applications from Sao Paulo in Brazil to Buenos Aires to Mumbai to Sydney, New York, you know, how are you going to process that? You've got a language issue there. You've got a whole set of technology um, uh, issues associated with communication. You've also got issues to do with how are you going to sift these people? How are you going to vet them? Um, and how are you going to verify that they are real people and that, you know, they're not, and how are you going to pay them? Yeah. You know, if you haven't got a business in, in, if you're Cisco, it's not a problem. You'll have an office in, in Argentina and you can probably pay the guy in, in Buenos Aires. But if you don't and you're based in Mumbai or in Melbourne, Australia, how do you pay an employee who's based in, in Buenos Aires? And how do you make sure he or she is legal? Right. You know, and how do we make sure it's not a money laundering exercise? How do we make sure that there's, so there's a whole raft of challenges that come in and technology can help. So, and I sad to say, I think that, you know, the other thing that's going to happen is the, the whole office, the way an office is structured is going to look very different. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate in January to visit a workplace transformation conference in London, which was hosted by uh, Cisco at which they talked about this with a number of the delegates and also with the speakers. And if you think about it, if we go back five years, we walked into, I don't know, probably your office in Mumbai will probably be, I know, an open plan office with, let's say, 50 desks in it, and you're all sat in like rows, and you've all got your own desk. Am I all right? That's what it would look like five years ago. But if you're only going in the office one day a week, is it right for your employer to 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 rent office space for your desk when you're only going to be sat at it one day a week. Mm -hmm. So we'll have shared desks. We'll have shared workspaces. Mm -hmm. And maybe when I go in the office, you know, you and your colleagues will be talking to each other and you may be in the office, but your colleague might be working from home. Or you might have another co colleague who's in London or one in New York. And how are you going to talk to them? So you need video conference facilities. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't need a big room with one TV and a microphone and a camera. You might just need a small booth. So when I went to Cisco's offices last year in um, Bedfont Lakes near Heathrow, they had like little pods that you went in, you know, with glass sides and a, and, a, and a solid back behind you. And there was a camera and a screen and you literally had a conversation with, the, with your colleague who was in New York and your other one who was in Warsaw in Poland and and so on and so forth so you could talk to different people in different locations so the redesign of an office will look very different and I think the recruitment world have got to wake up to that very quickly yeah um, I think people in recruitment so HR people need to think about this you know when you place a job board on a job advert normally you'd place it in a country wouldn't you yeah but if you're if you're looking for somebody to do a job for you in New York, where do you place it? Well, you'd normally place it in the US with somebody like Indeed. But if the person could work in Jakarta or Islamabad or Mumbai or, I don't know, Bahrain or even in South Africa in Johannesburg, where do you put your job advert? Do you have to put it on every single job board in every single country of the world? Right. So job boards will have pan-global structures, won't they? Right. So then what you'll get is job boards buying other job boards. Mm. Right. Wow. And what that means is we're going to have massive change. And what massive change does is it creates, it creates threats to businesses where... So if you're a big business right now, you'd be quite worried because you've got all of your customers aligned here and you've got all of your regional sales offices. But if the world is going to change, those relationships might be suddenly changed overnight, which creates disruption for new entrants into the market. So your business and my business is great because we, we haven't got as much to lose. 
But if you're IBM, Cisco or Salesforce, which are big global companies, you're quite worried because this disruption might mean that another company could come into the market where you're in. Yeah. So it creates opportunity and it creates threats. Right. Right. So yeah. back to your statement to me earlier, which is about mindset. It's about the glass being half empty or half full. Right. If you want to walk into this future world and be frightened because of the threats, or you can walk into this future world and see the opportunities. Yeah, and if you work with somebody like me, the benefit, whether it's me or anybody else, is my 35 years means I've seen lots of these periods of dramatic change many times. Yeah. And, and there are things that will change and there are things that will stay true. And your friendships, I hope for you, will stay true through all of this. And your business relationships, which are built on friendships, will stay true. Okay, so those things were really important, but you have to protect those, you have to nurture those, and you have to feed those, and you have to show your customers you have a value in the new world. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, you will grow, you will prosper, and if you can be innovative and you're responsive and you listen to your customers, you'll thrive. That's what it's all about. But if you don't listen to your customers, you're not responsive to the changes in the market, you're not looking at what your competitors are doing, don't be surprised if six months, 12 months down the line, your old customers have stopped dealing with you and they've gone to somebody else. That's my message to everybody. I think that's a great answer. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights. It was lovely speaking with you. And I believe I speak on behalf of the entire People Harm team when I say that it's conversations such as these that make leaders harm worthwhile. So thank you once again. Thank you very much. Please stay safe. I, I wish you all the best and I, I really hope we can speak to each other again. It's been an entire pleasure. I've loved it.